on that rock, and uh, it'll never pass away. Ezra chapter number four, if you found your place, I'd invite you to stand tonight. Ezra chapter number four, I want to begin in verse one, I'll read down to verse number six, and uh, the title for tonight's message is How Satan Hinders, How Satan Hinders. Ezra chapter number four, starting in verse one, the Bible says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Ezra Haddon, king of Asher, which brought us up, uh, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God. But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah. And drew, <coughs> excuse, excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> I don't think I can do that yet. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, this evening, Lord, uh, as we bow, uh, we ask you, Lord God, to speak to us, to quiet our hearts and steady our faith. And Lord, I want to ask you this evening that you'd help us to recognize the difference between building on the sand, building on a rock, uh, building something that is, sec- that is certain and sure because it is based upon timeless truths rather than on um, the ideas and the whims of men. I pray, Heavenly Father, tonight and ask you that you will use me and that you'll help me, God, <clears throat> uh, that uh, I'll be able to bring this message in a way that honors you, Lord. And Father, um, and that's clear. I want to be, be able to be clear, and, and uh, I, I want to, uh, as much of me as can be shoved aside, to be shoved aside so that as much of Christ uh, as can be as possible can show this evening, Father. I pray tonight in Jesus' name, Amen. I'll ask you to be seated this evening. <clears throat> so, one of the most important things I think a believer can understand can can get a handle on is this is that Satan is real. He is personal. He's actual. He's not not just a force. He's not just an idea. He's not just a thought. You know, uh, it wouldn't be impossible for someone to say, well, you know, I don't really believe that there is probably a a personal devil out there who's, you know, who instigates and makes bad things happen. I just think bad things happen and we we lump it into the name Satan or the devil and so forth. Satan... Um, Satan is, 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 is real. If the Bible is true at all, um, then, then this is an absolute truth. The devil is a real person. He doesn't have a, a physical body, but he can influence, influence people with physical bodies. Uh, Satan uh, cannot be in more than one place at one time, but he does have devils who follow him so that he is able to accomplish his will, his work, I, I should say, his work in uh, all of the world uh, at any time he wishes to do so. He's able, he's, it's not like he's locked into one place and he can't be everywhere at once, but he's got enough help that he can get things done in, in any place he wants to do it. Satan um, doesn't know everything. He's not omniscient like God is, but he does, he doesn't know everything, but he does know the Bible and he knows especially well how to misuse the Word of God. 
to twist it and, uh, and to, to make it say things that it doesn't say for his cause and his purpose. Satan is, um, and if, I, I hope I don't have to explain this, Satan is, is ugly to the core, but he can transform himself into something that appears beautiful. And by ugly, I mean just, you know, that wicked, that nasty, that, that kind of thing. He is ugly to the core, but he can transform himself into something that appears to be beautiful. Satan, we, we, we need to understand, Satan is real. And he is the enemy of all true faith in the living God. No, he's, he is a, the adversary of what we are doing tonight. He is opposed to this. And it's more than opposed, in, it, the opposition is more than an idea. You know, there is the Christian and there is the non-Christian and there are two different worldviews. Satan is more than a different worldview. He is an enemy, an actual enemy who commands an army who strives to hinder and to destroy the work of God. It's important for us to know this for a number of reasons. There's all kinds of reasons that, um, that this is an important truth. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them tonight. I think one of the most important reasons is to remember that any time a, um, a critical negative spirit arises in us toward the work of God, it is almost certainly satanically motivated. At least, if that spirit rises in us, we need to, uh, to examine ourselves to make sure that it isn't sat satanically motivated. And we should likely suspect that any time that we have some kind of a critical spirit uh, in us about the work of God, uh, that, we ought, that we ought to suspect that it is Satan uh, or one of his devils that is, uh, is involved in that. Also, any sort of desire to change um, the way of our worship ought to be viewed with suspicion because the devil doesn't like us worshiping in spirit and in truth. It is likely anything that kind of wants us to, to, to tends to want us to move to change uh, uh, the way that we worship or uh, the doctrines that we believe and so forth, we ought to, we ought to, to, to view those things with, with, with incredible suspicion. Um, I've been in the ministry very, very close to 40 years, not quite, but very close to 40 years now. And in those years, I've witnessed um, a, a considerable amount of change uh, in, in Christianity, in independent fundamental Baptist churches, certainly, but also in, Christi in Christianity in general. I've noticed a great, a great amount of change. And I noticed that among those who are, who are younger than I am, um, not everyone who's younger than me, but among those that are younger than I am, change is applauded. And, uh, uh, and among those that are my age and a little bit older, and not everyone my age and a little bit older, but among those my age and, and older, these changes are not so welcome. I kind of addressed that in the last message two Sundays ago, two Sunday nights ago. But, uh, but as, a general, as a general thing, People who are a little younger than me, they look at change as being um, uh, something to applaud and to encourage. They're, they're interested in change. They feel like change is necessary. And, and, uh, and, and they, they look at what their fathers did and, and, and their forefathers did in, in, in church. And they look at that and say, they, that's old-fashioned, that's wrong, and it won't work today. And we've got we to make things modified. We've got to change things new. And they, 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 they are critical of the old. And because of that, they, are, um, they, they, they accept and want to see change. They want to see the new. They want to see new things come up. And, and then, of course, there will be people my age that we tend to, um, uh, to be a little bit more, not always, but a little bit more uh, set in our ways. And, and they, the, the younger would say, well, you know, you're just like you are because you're an old fuddy-duddy and that kind of stuff. But that's not always why we, we take the position. So you'll hear sometimes, and these are, these are things that I've heard, things like this, statements that, say, um, uh, that are pointed at people my age and older, and they'll say, uh, you're preaching the same old messages you preached in the 1980s. 
<clears throat> and I want to ask you, uh, well, wait a minute, let me save, save that for a minute. Um, when I was in college, so, you know, they'll say to people my age, they'll say, um, uh, you know, you're preaching the same messages you preached in the 1980s. When I was in college, it was slightly a little bit different than that, and the accusation was more like this. They'd say, uh, you're still doing church like they did it in the 1950s. And, uh, you know, 30 years have gone down the road, and so, <laughs> so more than 30. But here, here's the thing. Um, uh, we're preaching a Bible that hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Um, what changes do you suppose we should make? <laughs> do you honestly believe that in the last 30 years that the world has raised up people smarter than the Christians were 30 and 50 years ago or 100 years ago? Do you honestly believe that, that people today read the Bible and they understand it better than a preacher did in the uh, 1700s or in the 1600s or maybe in the 1500s when he would die for what he read in the Bible. You honestly believe that we're smarter than they are and that, we, that we've got better revelation and better understanding of the Word of God than they do. I, I, don't, think, I'm gonna, I don't think everything that, that they did in the 1950s was absolutely right, but I am sure that any changes we've made since then are not for the better. I, I understand that they weren't perfect and and, uh, and they understood that they weren't perfect, but I can tell you that, um, that a spirit that says, I don't like what they did in the 50s, therefore we're going to change it because I don't like it, that's not for the better. And it's not ever going to, things do not generally change for the better, they generally change for the worse. In the, in the 1940s, 1950s, fundamental Baptist churches left the old conventions because those conventions had gone uh, modernistic and liberal, and, uh, and those terms have changed today. We don't usually use those terms modernistic or liberal quite as much. Now the term, the popular term is called progressive, but it's the same thing, it's the same thing. Uh, and progressive is no better than liberal. So I'm pretty concerned when uh, pastors claiming to be independent Baptists learn from um, progressive teachers. Uh, I'm concerned when um, they use progressive methods. Uh, they'll say, well, our message hasn't changed. We're just changing our methods for the times. I'm pretty concerned when they use progressive methods because they feel like it makes their message more effective. I'm pretty concerned about that. I am pretty concerned when, um, when independent Baptists begin to associate with progressive organizations. I'm pretty concerned about that. When we, when we become uh, critical of our teachers and when we speak negatively of the churches that we grew up in and even change the doctrines that we once uh, preached, I think we ought to at least, at least we ought to pause a little bit and, um, and examine whether these actions in us may be prompted of the devil. It might not be that, boy, we understand the Bible better than our preacher daddy did or our, 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 the preacher we grew up under, under did. It might be that, not that we understand the Bible better. It might be that we've gotten some influence from satanic things. When, um, when you meet a brand new preacher and or when you meet uh, a new popular preacher, up and coming preacher, and he's gathering a crowd together and, uh, and everyone's saying, well, look at this. He's, I mean, he is preaching what we always knew was true and the preachers and the 40s and the 50s and the and the in my age group 70s and 80s preachers, you know um, that he, this, these preachers today they just understand the word of God better than they did uh, back 30 40 years ago when when um, you get enamored by uh, by new movements like that I, I think at least at the very least it would be wise um, to take a step back. Before you do anything, before you make any statements and before you jump ship and, and, and swim out to another boat, before you do anything like that, it might be wise for you to stop and take some time and see whether the devil might be the one who is motivating your movements. Satan is real. He's actual. 
He, he literally exists. He isn't, doesn't have a physical body, but he is able to influence us physically. He is able to do that. Satan is deceptive, and he is able to appear beautiful, and he is able to appear right, and he is able to appear appealing. He is able to appeal to the human nature. He is someone to take caution of. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 15, 13 through 15, we're going to get here in just a, a few Sundays uh, in the, the Sunday school hour, adult Sunday school hour, excuse me, but the Bible says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So he's able to do, um, he is able to appear um, popular, appealing, uh, uh, beautiful, and right. He's able to do that. But, but the word of God does tell us that we are not ignorant of his devices. So it isn't, it isn't necessary for anyone to be uh, deceived. He is deceptive. He is a good liar, but you don't have to be, um, you don't have to be deceived. We are not ignorant of his devices. Um, and so we don't have to be, we, we have all kinds of scripture to teach us the, the methods that, the devil employs to get an advantage of us and to hinder and hurt the work of God. We, we can know uh, his tactics. We can know his plan. We can, we can know what he uses and, and how he will use us to try to hinder uh, his work. And so our passage tonight is, is just one of those passages where we find the work of God being hindered. And, um, and while the name uh, of Satan is not present, uh, I'm going to suggest to you that, that the devil is all over this thing. Anything that wants to hinder the work of God, uh, I want to suggest to you the devil is all over that. And so uh, we've got in our passage, you know, we know this from what we've read. So we know that it was God who allowed Nebuchadnezzar to capture the Jews in the first place, take them into captivity. We know that, don't we? It's an interesting thing. I, I, I'm reading the book of Jeremiah right now in my personal devotions, part of my, my daily visit with the Lord. And it's an interesting thing. Jeremiah preached and preached and preached and preached to the Jews. He kept preaching this. You've got to go into, you, you've got to surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. You've got to follow Nebuchadnezzar. You've got to leave this land and go to Babylon. If you will, if you will surrender to Nebuchadnezzar and go to Babylon, you'll survive. And that's what you need. You need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. They wouldn't do it. And so they were destroyed. When Nebuchadnezzar took over the land of, uh, uh, of Judah, uh, he left, he took all the royalty and so forth, but he left the poor of the land and he left, gave them a leader. Uh, and of course that leader was killed, but uh, he, he gave them leadership and he left some people in the land and, and he left Jeremiah in the land. And uh, now, now they've, um, so um, some guy come on named Ishmael killed the governor that Nebuchadnezzar had left in the land. And so all of a sudden these poor uh, people that are in Jerusalem, they're thinking, oh no, now Nebuchadnezzar is going to come back and get us because uh, we killed the governor that he, and, and uh, you know, the people who killed the, the, the governor, they were saying, we got to get out of here. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come after us. And then so Jer but Jeremiah is there and he says, no, here's the thing. If you'll stay put, you'll be okay. Don't leave. Don't run. If you'll, so he's telling for all those years he preached, you got to leave, you got to leave, you got to leave, you got to leave. Now he's going to say to the ones that are left, you got to stay, you got to stay, you got to stay, you got to stay. The ones he had preached, you got to leave, um, uh, stayed and they died. And the ones he said, um, you got to stay, left, and they died. <laughs> but in both cases, God's at work. And, um, and, and we know that it was God who allowed Nebuchadnezzar to capture the Jews and take him into captivity. We also know that it was God who stirred up the spirit of Cyrus to allow the Jews to return to Jerusalem. We know that that was of God. But I'm telling you, it was not God who moved the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin to hinder the building of the temple of the Lord. That was not God. God had removed the Jews 
And 70 years later, God return, returned the Jews, but it was not God who, t- who led these and moved upon these adversaries of Judah and Benjamin to hinder them in the building of the work of the Lord. And I want to I give you tonight the threefold movement that these adversaries of God's people had. And I want to suggest to you that these three movements, these three tactics, are among the most popular of the devil's devices, of Satan's devices, especially in hindering what happens in the house of God. They're not the only ones, but these are among his most popular, and we see them time and time again throughout the scriptures. They they don't always happen in the same order that we find them in Ezra chapter number four. They don't always happen in that same order, uh, but it seems to me like when I study church history that Satan kind of mixes them up a little bit and he'll use one tactic for a time, then he'll switch to another tactic for a time, and then he'll come back to the first tactic for a time, then he'll mix it up and go back to the third tactic and and he'll mix it up a little bit, sometimes moving back to one he's already used and so forth. But these three tactics that we're going to see tonight are some of his, of the devil's most popular. Number one, the adversaries, the first thing that we see that the adversaries did is they tried to use compromise, the tactic of compromise. Look at verses 1 and 2. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of captivity of the captivity builded the temple of the Lord uh, God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Ezra Hayden, king of Asher, which brought us up hither. Let us build with you. Uh, we seek the same God that you do. You know, it's the It's the word of God that tells us that they're adversaries. They didn't say they were adversaries. They said they were friends. Not everybody who's friendly to you is your friend. Yeah, not everybody who acts friendly to you is your friend. They didn't say they were adversaries. Uh, They didn't say that about themselves. God said, though, God's word says they were adversaries. What they said about them, here's what they said about themselves. They said, number one, we do sacrifice to God. We we sacrifice, I'm I'm taking these in in reverse order of what we're going to see here. But number one, they said, we sacrifice to God. We, just like you do, we sacrifice to God. They have a, they had a form of worship and they had been faithful to that form of worship as well. Not only did they have it, and it sounds like they had developed this form of worship in the land of Israel, that they had developed this form of worship since the time that the Jews had left the land. So for 70 years, it sounds like they've been in this land for 70 years, and for 70 years, they've been sacrificing to God. That sounds faithful to me. In the case of this passage, they'd even made their sacrifices in and around the city of Jerusalem. The adversaries of God can be very religious, even spiritual people. Uh, Can look a lot like God's people sometimes. There's even, I think, a little bit of a play for compassion in this passage. Because they they say this, they say, Since the days of Ezra Hayden, king of Asher, which brought us up hither. Um, So the Jews, they had been taken captive and taken out of the land. And it sounds like these people had been taken captives and brought into the land. We're just like you are. We're captives. We've been removed from our home. We've, we're, we're displaced just like you're displaced. We're very similar. There's not much difference between you and, and, and between your people and my people. We um, were taken and uh, you were taken and removed to another place and we were taken and removed to another place. We're very similar to you. And now, though, we've come to this place where you, your family's from. And when we got here, we began sacrificing to God. And uh, so you were conquered and captured, we've, and, and just like uh, we've been conquered and captured just like you, we've been removed from our homes just like you. You know, it might be that you and I would, um, that would really like these people. It might be that, uh, that very few people would ever see them as adversaries of the Lord. It might be that you'd look at them and we'd look at them and we'd say, man, they are just like us. There isn't in, maybe they didn't go to the same church that we did and, and, um, and maybe they didn't uh, sing exactly the same songs that we did and, and uh, maybe they didn't dress exactly the same way that we did, but um, they're just like us. They're, they really are. They're, maybe they have a few little differences in their doctrine, but they're just like us. 
us. There's not much difference whatsoever. I, I know I've told you this story. When I, when I was young, uh, just out of, out of high school and, and on my own, I was um, uh, very interested in spiritual things. And, uh, just, you know, and, and one day, uh, at the age of 18 years old, I heard Rex Humbard uh, on the television give the plan of salvation and pointed out in the television screen and said, you out there in television land, right where you are, kneel down and pray. Ask the Lord to save me. And I did that. And, uh, uh, but the only thing is, is I didn't have a church to go to. And so within just a few weeks, um, this, uh, this lady and her children came to, uh, to, into the trailer court where I lived. I was out working on my pickup. I was always working on my pickup. I was out working on my pickup, and, and uh, they asked me if I was interested in spiritual things. And I told them, yes, in fact, I was interested in spiritual things. In fact, I had just recently um, received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, and they congratulated on me on that and, uh, and said, listen, I'll tell you what, we would like to offer you an in-home Bible study. Well, I didn't go to church, and, uh, and I was rodeo cowboy in, in those days, traveling a lot, so Sundays were not a good time for me anyway, because I'd be gone. And here's a guy, they, uh, they were willing to send a guy to my house to give me uh, uh, in-home Bible studies at my convenience and my time and so forth. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, in a week or so, um, uh, we made arrangements, and in a week or so, this man came to my house. He was a very kind uh, elderly man, I was, like I say, 18 years old at the time. Uh, maybe, I don't think I was quite 19 yet. And uh, he started coming to my house. You know, I can still remember one of the first things he did is he pulled out his Bible. He said, now, this Bible is just like everyone else's Bible. It's just like the Bible that the Catholic Church uses. And it's just like the Bible that the Presbyterian Church in town uses. And it's just like the Bible that the Nazarene Church in town uses. It's just like their Bible. It was a New Age. Um, no, it wasn't. Uh, it, um, it's the, it was Jehovah's Witness Bible. Can't remember what they're called right now. And, uh, but he wanted me to know it's just like their Bible. We're not different at all. In fact, he spent a good deal of time when every time he came to my house showing, pointing out how similar his church was to all of the other churches that were out there. The other thing that he would do is he would compliment my parents. And, uh, and because I was such a, he, he was complimenting me, but he would say, man, you must have really wonderful parents. You are such a fine young man. You must have, and by doing that, so he's stroking me, making me feel good about me, but he's also making me feel good about my family. And uh, he's trying to, Win my favor like that. I'm, you know, I, and to be honest with you, he was a very, very likable man and came to my house for about two months, I think, before I, I, I got suspicious and, and so forth and, and got rid of him. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I'm just saying, you know, those who are the adversaries, they might be that you'd like them really well and it might be uh, that you'd have a hard time seeing that they are adversaries of the Lord. You know, the reason why a wolf wears sheep's clothing is so the sheep won't know he's a wolf. I'm just, I'm just saying, if the wolf wears sheep's clothing so you don't know he's a wolf, there's probably wolves in your life that you think are sheep. You need to be just a little bit careful. Some of those people that are hanging around you and some of those people that are telling you, uh, you know, that are, that are appealing to you and that are pulling you in and trying to get you into their groups and get you out of what you grew up in and out of where you got saved and out of the, the doctrines that you've been taught, some of those that are doing that, they're not sheep at all, they're wolves. And, um, and they have every intention of pulling you, of, of destroying you spiritually, not helping you out. It's the, it's the shepherd's job to study all of the wolves out there and the, the different kinds of clothing that wolves in sheep's clothing wear so, and carefully spot the real sheep from the wolf and, and, uh, so that he can protect his sheep. So, uh, number one, um, hey, we, we sacrifice to God. We're not different than you at all. We sacrifice to God in the city of Jerusalem. We sacrifice to God. Number two, we seek your God as you do. Just like you seek God, we seek your God. Not only do we seek, your, not only do we seek God, we seek your God as you do. I, I attempted to answer uh, this a little, a little bit in my Sunday school lesson this morning. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and the Pentecostals and the Jews and the Muslims and the Catholics, and you can go on and on with that. They all claim to seek the same God that you and I seek tonight. And it takes some careful consideration and some pretty solid convictions to recognize that despite their claims, their God is not our God. 
They can call him, they can say he is our God, and they can make him look as much like our God as they want to make him look, and they can try to convince us that their God is our God, but their God is not our God. Their God, little g, is not like, is not our God, big G. He's not. We, we sacrifice just like you. Let us build with you. Let us... Let, let's just join hands together uh, um, and, and help you build the temple. Let's just do that and, uh, because uh, uh, we sacrifice like you do and we seek God like you do. And so let us build with you. It's such a, it's such a tempting thing, you know, uh, that old phrase, many hands make light work. Who doesn't want more hands? Um, you know, I'm getting ready to go this week. We're going to go to a... Uh, to, a, to a preacher's meeting in Yakima. I've been going to this meeting for, um, I don't even know how many years. Uh, how many years have I been going? As long as, um, how old is, how old is Bohannon? So, um, so, yeah, we don't, it, public, we are on, online right now commit, admitting that my wife doesn't even know how old our oldest son is. Uh, 35. <laughs> and so, and so, <laughs> and so 35, so that means we've been going to this thing for like 36 years. We've been going to this meeting for 36 years. And, um, so, and I'm just going to tell you something. When a preacher goes to a preacher in the early days, I, you know, um, it was, you know, 12. The first couple of times we went to Yakima, it was like 12. And then it was 15. And after three years, I think it was uh, like 20 or 22 after three years. But there was one year I got to get up and, and when I gave my testimony, I said we had 96 in church last week. I'm one of the big dogs now. <laughs> and I'm somebody, you know, and uh, who doesn't want more people? I mean, who, want, who doesn't want more people? <laughs> I used to, in those days, we had a meeting in that, uh, that abandoned gas station building, so there was one half of the building that we rented, and we had it, um, and we had a, set up an auditorium in there, and then we rented the little room that where the cash register would have been in the gas station, and that was my office slash Sunday school slash nursery Room and then there was the other half of the uh, of the gas station and it was like where the garage would have been you know and things like that and um, I would go when you know before the services we'd have you know like you know five or ten and Anita would be there and and maybe one other family would be there and so forth and before the service I'd go into that that old the apartment we we didn't rent and I would I would peek through the crack in the garage doors just ask God please. Just one more car. <laughs> just one more family. <laughs> Let me have just one more family to preach to today. I mean, who doesn't want more hands? Who doesn't want to have, I mean, more people. And we all, I mean, it's just, it's something that we want. And, and, um, uh, and, then, and then sometimes when those people come, you know, those more hands make light work. And, and that's wonderful. So when you can say you've got, you know, 96, that's wonderful. And when some of them, actually tithe, it's wonderful -er. You know, sometimes they come and they've got money. <laughs> what a wonderful thing, because, you know, I, it does take some money to do this. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, here, let us build with you, and uh, we'll be, you know, more hands on the, on the plow, and, uh, and we'll have uh, more um, resources to work with, more finances. Uh, we've been worshiping uh, God already. Uh, maybe we can, um, and, and so we'll do something like this. Yeah, these are my, here's, so, so here's what we're doing. We're saying, all right, well, look at this. These people are offering to join up with us and help us. They're not quite like us. They're not. And uh, maybe they don't even like everything we're doing, and, and uh, maybe we don't like everything that they've been doing, but, uh, um, but they would give us more hands for the work, and they would maybe uh, provide some more money for the work, and uh, they have been worshiping God already, and maybe we can straighten them out doctrinally. I have learned this, and, and I, 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 no, I haven't learned it at all. I am learning it. I'm going to learn it for the rest of my life. I have learned it. But I am learning that no one ever gets straightened out. And that might seem a little bit cynical, and, there, and no one is probably not completely true. There are some, but it is not many. Most people who disagree, all, they learn how to smile and cover their disagreement, but they still disagree. 
It might be that they don't have any place else to be, and it might be that, or it might be that they've got some nefarious things. But they, I mean, you're, you, they don't get straightened out. I mean, it is, uh, it's not. And I guarantee this: I am not a good enough teacher to convince anybody that they're wrong and I'm right. And uh, if something happens, it's all the Lord. And so, you know, uh, after all, they seek the same God that we do. And, uh, yeah, there's some, we can come in, we can work together, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. I, I know I made mention of this um, in that last message, but I think it, it bears repeating uh, for me to, to tell a story. When I, was in, when I was in Bible college, we were warned. Um, this was one of the class. I don't remember even why it came up in a class. But, but we, were, we were given a story and warned about this kind of thing happening for those of us who want to be church planners. And uh, so the story story was like this. There's a church planner, an independent Baptist church planner, who, um, uh, you know, went to a, he went to a town to plant a church, start a new church there. And of course, as an independent Baptist starting a church, he doesn't have money, he doesn't have people, he doesn't have a building, he doesn't have anything. And uh, uh, to get started with, you know, resources, we didn't, um, in, in the day when I went to school, we didn't do, um, uh, w- w- they discouraged uh, su- supporting church planters. Uh, because a missionary going to a foreign field, he could not work for his living. He could, once you get to a foreign field, you know, those foreign countries, they won't let a, a missionary uh, take a job from one of their own people. And so you, you don't get to work on the foreign field. Therefore, every dollar that, uh, that is given to missions, it needs to go to foreign missions because those people can't get jobs and the church planters can get jobs and a church planter ought to get a job. That's what I was taught in, in school, is that a church planner ought to get a job and, uh, and work and support his family that way while he's planting the church so that, his, uh, so that the missions money can go to the foreign field. And I was taught those sorts. So a church planner, you know, you're telling this story about this church planner. He goes to a town and he's got no money. He's got no support and, uh, you know, got a family and all those things and having to work a job and, and so forth, uh, be able to take care of his family. And he's all of a sudden, he's approached by the... Um, representative, the field representative from the Southern Baptist Convention. And this field representative, it's a town that they don't, the Southern Baptist didn't have a, a church in. And, and uh, so the, uh, uh, this field representative came and offered him, so we can give you full-time support. And we can help you buy land and build a building. We can help you get this church off the ground. All you need to do is agree to bring your church into our convention. And... Uh, I was taught, you know, that, man, uh, that's a temptation you're going to face, young men. You're going to face that temptation. Don't do it. Don't give in to the devil like that. And we were, we were taught to expect those sorts of offers, and we were taught to resist them. When I got to Astoria, now, the Southern Baptist never did offer to build me a building, buy me a land, or build me a building, but their representative did come by and pointed out the, Southern, the new, shiny new Southern Baptist building that they had built for their church planter in Warrington. na 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 if you had been one of us and not one of them, you'd have been able to have a building like this. That kind of stuff they did. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, so, so uh, I was taught, you know, we don't, we don't want to join in with those groups. And now we've got all kinds of people who are saying, man, praise the Lord. We've found a new grace and we can get back in with the Southern Baptists. I'm just going to tell you, Southern Baptists haven't gotten better in 30 years. They haven't gotten better by any means. So what's the answer? So the, uh, one of the devil's devices is compromise. The answer to compromise is separation. Look at verse 3. The Bible says, But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus the king of Persia had commanded us. Ye have nothing to do with us. No, we... we we don't want to have anything at all to do with you. And I don't think separation means you have to be unkind, but it does mean that you have nothing to do with the compromise. The second device that, uh, in, that I see in this passage is the, is the devil's device of conflict. Look at verse number 4. Within the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. And troubled there, in other words, they attempted to physically disrupt them. They attempted to stop them physically from doing the work. The same guys who had just said, we sacrifice to God just like you do, and we seek God just like you do, help us, let us build the temple with you, are now uh, completely changed their tune and are literally trying to stop them, to trouble their work and to stop them from building. 
Um, you know, where there's just shy of 1,500 years of Christian history to show how people can go from claiming to be on your side to trying to kill you if necessary to stop what you're doing. It's exactly what happened to Jesus. First year is his year of popularity, and there's multitudes who follow him. Jesus, we come to John chapter number 6, and Jesus preached some hard sayings, and, and all those people left except for, the, except for the 12. Everybody left him, and, and, uh, and the assumption is, and I, think, I don't think there's anything wrong with the assumption, is that when, um, when, when they're hollering, crucify him, crucify him, we have no king but Caesar. Some of those folks that got, that got to eat the fed from the bread and the fishes, the loaves and the fishes, some of those people were crying, now crying, crucify him, crucify him. Some of those people who were pressing on him to become their king were now the ones who were saying, we have no king but Caesar. He didn't do for us what we wanted him to do for us, and therefore we turned against him. Uh, Constantine claimed to be a Christian and offered to, uh, to protect all of the Christians in the Middle East under, that were in his domain. Uh, all they needed to do was come under his leadership. And if they would just, you know, he's now one of them. He's a believer just like they're believers. And so you who are believers, you just come under my protection, under, under my authority, under my leadership. I'll protect you. I'll take care of you. I'll make sure that you've got uh, the resources you need. I'll make sure that your enemy are taken care of. I'll give you everything you need so that you're safe. And, and boy, there were, there were people in those days who uh, praised the Lord. God has delivered us. And they uh, came under the, the yoke of Caesar. But then, you know, everyone who, all of those Christians who said, no, we, um, uh, we, uh, we have no head in our church but Jesus Christ. Um, uh, Constantine and then those who followed him uh, led in persecution after persecution after persecution uh, to try to exterminate those Christians who would not come under his authority. Martin Luther used the Anabaptists of Germany to help him in his plight from, from the Pope, but when he gained power over Germany, he turned his armies against the Anabaptists. And these th things have been pretty um, easy for us Christians here in the United States, but you know, there's no promise that it has to stay that way, and indications are that it might not stay that way much longer. So what's, what's the answer? Conflict. What's the answer to conflict? What was the answer in their day? Um, um, I'm, I'm just going to... Confrontation. The answer to conflict is confrontation. You, you, have, you, have, to, you have to go nose to nose with the enemy. If the enemy is going to, to fight, you have to go nose to nose. And you don't see it really in the account of the book of Ezra, but we know we have some other books of the Bible that, that speak about the same period of time. Most of the Old Testament, uh, the minor prophets, uh, not all of them, but, but most of them, the minor prophets deal, are dealing with this same time period that, Ezra, uh, that the book of Ezra is written in. Uh, the book of Nehemiah, the book of Esther are, are in this same time period. And uh, so we can know something about what's going on in this time in, in Ezra. Ezra, we can know something about what's going on for him because of what goes on in the book of Nehemiah or uh, in, um, in Habakkuk or something like that. And so you don't see uh, the uh, confrontation happening here, uh, but, uh, but you do see it, for instance, in the book of, of, of Nehemiah. In Nehemiah, uh, he's building the walls. He's not building the temple. He's building the walls of Jerusalem. In Nehemiah, there is an offer by the adversaries of compromise, and then there is a direct, because he doesn't give in to the compromise, we can't go down. We're doing a great work. We cannot quit this work to go down to you. And uh, uh, because he would not compromise with them, there, became, there, was great, there was direct conflict. And here's what the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. It came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us and, and God had brought their counsel to naught that we returned all of us to the wall, everyone into his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half of them held both spirits and shields and bows and habergens and, and, and the rulers were behind, behind all the house of Judah and they which built it on the wall and they that, that bear burdens with those that laid it every one uh, of him, every, with every one with one of his hands wrought in the work and with the other held a weapon that's called confrontation right there now of course you understand that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal I'm not telling you that because when someone 
uh, directly conflicts, conf causes conflict in the church, that what we want to do is we want to go um, grab, you know, billy clubs or something. I'm not, I'm not recommending that. Um, and, but while we work to serve the Lord in the house of God, we need to put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians chapter number 6, and we need to use the word of God and prayer to engage our enemies. The spiritual uh, weapons that we've got. So there's the, the device of, of compromise, there's a device of, of, of conflict, and then thirdly, there's the device, Satan's device of is accusation. Look at verses 5 through 6, Ezra chapter 4, verses 5 through 6, and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia, and in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. So they wrote a letter of accusation. Now, here's what we know about the devil. We know that the devil is an accuser. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The devil is called. Now, he is a liar. But he, and the father of it, but he is, one of his names is the accuser of the brethren. I'm telling you, there's something wrong with the person who claims to be a Christian, but is a constantly accusing others for their problems. Well, it's their fault, and they're, they're pointing their fingers at others, and, you know, they've got a problem in their life, and they're, but rather than addressing their pro the problem in their life, they're saying, it's their fault, and if he wouldn't have said this, and if she wouldn't have done that, and if they didn't, and, uh, and it's always someone, when someone points their fingers at others, they claim to be a Christian, but rather than coming to the altar, rather than confessing their sins, rather than dealing with their own, the issues of their life, coming to God, and dealing with the issues of their life, what they do instead is start pointing fingers, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's their fault, it's their fault. There is something wrong with that kind of Christianity. The devil is an accuser. The believer is not supposed to be a, a, an accuser. Um, we know also, not only is he called the accuser of the brethren, but we see him actually practicing accusation in the book of Job. In Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that... Feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, doth, doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him, about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased. But put forth thine hand now, and touch him that he, uh, all, touch all that he hath, and he'll curse thee to thy face. So notice what happens. God praised Job. Satan accused Job. So there's some... Here's God, and he says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? He's perfect. He's upright. He's just. He fears God and eschews evil. Listen, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, all God sees in you is the righteousness of Christ. If you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come in your heart, forgive your sins, and to save you, <laughs> just think of it this way. And I, I, I believe that things have changed a little bit from the time of Job's day. But think of it like this. God saying, uh, uh, the devil, have you seen my servant Daniel? He's perfect. Have you seen his wife, Sister Pickens? She's perfect. Have you seen Miss Connie? She's perfect. Jameson, he's perfect. God looks at you and you know what he said? He says, you're perfect. Because all he ever sees in you is Jesus Christ. You've been hidden in the personal Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus took your sin and gave you the righteousness of God. And so God only praises you. <clears throat> but the devil, he won't let you forget your sins. So Brother Michael, God says you're perfect. 
He looks at you and he says, you're perfect. He doesn't see any sin in you. He sees no fault in you whatsoever. You are perfect. I'll bet right now you don't feel perfect. And the more I say it, the more you don't feel perfect, huh? Because as much as we might know doctrinally that that is true, we have an adversary who accuses us. He beats us down. He works us over with accusations. Because while God only sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ in us, the devil refuses to see that righteousness and only sees the nature of sin in us. And we are only too aware of our sin nature. So it's not that hard to beat us down, to get us to see that. What's the answer to the accusation? The answer is appeal. Um, and I want to get ahead of myself in the study of the book of Ezra, but what's going to happen is that they're going to appeal to the king, and eventually Darius, Darius will approve the building. When it, what's going to happen? He's going to learn that Cyrus is the one who's already given permission for them to build. And so uh, here's these accusations, and you know, well, we need to re investigate this thing. And as he begins to investigate, he realizes they've been pr given permission to do this. And, uh, and um, so they're going to appeal, the, the Jews are going to appeal to the king for permission to regain their work. You know, there are times when, um, you know, we need to make appeals to human authorities. I think Paul did that. I appealed to Caesar. Um, there are times when we need to make appeals to human authorities. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. But, you know, our most, the most important appeal we can ever make, and especially when, you know, the devil begins to accuse us, um, we start feeling lower than dirt. You know, I couldn't ever be a witness for God. I, I could never talk to someone about Jesus. I could never invite someone to come to church. I could never talk about the Lord. Um, I know me, and I know what I've done, and, and you, all those kind of thoughts come in your mind. And you know, you feel like you're, you're, you, you know, it just you're unworthy of God. What you need to do is you need to appeal to God. You need you need to go to God. You, he must be our first and final, and um, and our always appeal. Go to God. God, 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 I'm just going to tell you, if, if you get on your knees and something keeps beating you up and you haven't gotten a hold of, stay on your knees and keep appealing to God until you get a hold of God. If you're still on your, if you're on your knees and you're still feeling lower than dirt, it's because you haven't met God. Because God is only going to praise you. He is only going to pick you up. He is only going to remind you of who you are in His Son. He is going to remind you of the promises that he, that he has made for you. He's going to remind you of the future that you have. That's what he's going to do. You just need to, you need to stay in the presence of God until the Bible says resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Stay in the presence of submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I think I'm getting ahead of myself in my notes again. Resist the, submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You stay in the presence of God. You stay submitted to God until all of a sudden you can hear the voice of God over the voice of the accuser. And you get up. Our, our adversary is real. He is active. He is powerful. He can take lost people captive at his will. He can plant wolves in sheep's clothing in our churches. He can sway our own thinking so that we become a hindrance to the house of God, to the work of God, but we are not ignorant of his devices. And more importantly, when we resist him through humility, he has to flee. And so we're not ignorant of his devices. If, if that spirit of criticism, negative props up in you, just take a step back for a little bit. That is not God. Something makes you want to leave and go to another place where they've got newer things and different ways of doing stuff. Just take a step back. That isn't God. That isn't God. 
something gets you, you know, let's just buy into some of the newer things. If we would just kind of give a little bit on this thing, Pastor, if you just give a little bit on this thing, we could have some more people coming and, you know, that would help everything. If we could just, you know, that isn't God. That isn't God. When the devil begins to knock you down and you feel like, you know, dirt, Take a step back. Get on your knees. Because it's, it's not God who's beating you up. That's the devil. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I want to ask you now that your Holy Spirit will bless as we prepare for these few moments of, of invitation. Lord God, I want to thank you uh, for your word. I want to thank you that, that um, while there is a very real, very active and powerful enemy that we're not ignorant of his devices,